I think we'll probably should get started. Okay, yeah, let me open the participant panel. All right, welcome everyone to um, today's physiology seminar. Today I have the fortune to introduce my collaborator and our colleague, um, Ezra Burstein, MD, PhD, <laughs> from the Department of Internal Medicine. And Ezra obtained his medical doctor degree from, you have to correct me, <laughs> Cayetano Heredia uh, University in Lima, Peru. <laughs> yeah, so in 1994. And then he came to UT Southwestern, uh, the Department of Internal Medicine, for his residency in 1995. And subsequently, he did, uh, well, he did his residency here, and then he had a fellowship in um, gastroenterology at Universal Michigan. And then subsequently, he also did his postdoctoral research um, in immunology with uh, Dr. Gary Nabel and uh, Colleen Duckett. Um, so in 2004, he became assistant professor at University of Michigan. And in 2008, he moved from University of Michigan to UT Southwestern. And since then, he rose through the rank of assistant to associate a professor of tenure and then professor. Now he holds the position. Um, so he, oh, well, Ezra is the program director of the, um, of a training pro, um, of a, uh, of a T32 training program. And he's also a chief of um, division of digestive and the liver disease, uh, of the liver disease at UT Salsa Medical Center. And he's also a director of the Pola Family Center for Research in Inflammatory Bowel Disease. And he's also an endowed chair um, of Bertrand and Cecile Patterson in gastroenterology. So Ezra has all it takes to be a, <laughs> Ezra is a wonderful, I mean, if you look at his CV, uh, is, is a physician scientist and he has made a lot, besides his contribution in the clinical part, and he has made a lot of contribution in science as well. Most significantly, he has discovered um, the COMD protein family, which um, plays important role in endosomal sorting, in copper homeostasis, and also in inflammation and unity. So this is a very, very interesting process that today he's going to tell us more about this. I want to mention that it's actually through this physiology seminar that I gave last year, Ezra and I came to know each other and we have been started um, to collaborate and it's been a wonderful experience. We now actually co-advising a PhD student, Hannes Bach, and uh, working on um, a pro an exciting project on, um, on the, related to endosome. So today, Ezra's, well, without further ado, Ezra's seminar, ooh, okay, yeah. Ezra's, the title of Ezra's seminar is Recycling in the Endosomal Compartment, Understanding the Role of the CCC Complex. Okay, yeah, now that's, Great, thank you so much, Jen. Uh, that was very kind of you. And uh, I wanna also thank the department for giving me the opportunity to share the work of my lab and, and have a chance to talk to, to this audience. I look forward to hearing your comments in the Q&A question, and I'll try to take some pauses as I go along uh, with the presentation. Um, so I wanna start at the end. Uh, I wanna make sure I have enough time to thank the people that did the work uh, that I'm gonna share with you. This is really a compilation of work that spans well over a decade now um, that I tried to, to thread into a, into a coherent uh, unified story and sharing some of the more recent things at, towards the end of the talk. So most of the work was, has been done by Amica Singla uh, a wonderful person in my in my research group, as well as some alumni of the lab who have since left, who I've marked here. I also need to say that um, a lot of the work has that I will share was also um, completed in a uh, close collaboration with Dan Billadu at the Mayo Clinic, with whom I have um, a joint R01, as well as collaborations over many years with uh, Bart van der Slaus in Europe and Pico in the U.S. Okay, so before we get uh, to talk about the CCC complex, uh, I wanted to briefly talk about some basic definitions of what uh, organelle or set of organelles we're talking about and how, at least in my mind, uh, I, I think about them. So the endosomal system is this collection of intracellular vesicles that are linked to the flux of 
membranes that is produced in the process of endocytosis. These um, intracellular vesicles will um, contribute membranes and, and cargo back to the plasma membrane as well as to other organelles in, intracellularly, particularly uh, producing a flux of membranes towards the lysosome. There are other interconnections of the endosomal system besides the plasma membrane and the lysosome. The membranes from the endosome will also be, can be in, interconnected with the transvolgin network. So one key feature here is not only the transfer of uh, membranes in form of um, vesicles that move back and forth between these different compartments, but the transmembrane proteins that are embedded in those membranes. Uh, the movement of those uh, transmembrane proteins, which we're going to call cargo proteins, is a highly regulated process where proteins are identified and routed to the proper location in the cell. Sometimes that routing is uh, going to change based on cues that the cell receives from uh, the cell surface or, or intracellular signals. Um, content of the vesicles is also going to be delivered to particular locations. There's transfer of membranes in this active uh, cycling as well as changes in the lipid composition. All of this is occurring in, in this collection of vesicles that we call the endosomal system. Now, uh, from what you heard from Jen as a, as a gastroenterologist and somebody who trained in, in immunology, you might ask, how, how did I get involved in the process of endosomal sorting? So uh, I think I, I owe you uh, at least one slide of introduction on that. So, the, the core interest of my lab have been to understand how inflammation contributes to human pathology, particularly in the digestive tract. And it, it's in that context that we were studying the regulation of the NF-kappa B pathway, a key pro-inflammatory transcription factor. And this is work that we did many years back. Um, we were particularly paying attention to how NF-kappa B initiated transcription is turned off. At the time, it was clearly recognized that one mechanism is through the active export of DNA-bound NF-kappa B subunits back to the cytosol through the I-kappa B protein family. What we and others contributed to this knowledge was the identification of another pathway where DNA-bound NF-kappa B subunits undergo ubiquitination, um, and that this process is regulated by a particular ubiquitin ligase. It is in that context that I found, we found, that this required a mysterious small protein called COMD1. Absent that, the ubiquitination of NF-kappa B subunits was suboptimal, and NF-kappa B mediated transcription was exaggerated, and, and that promotes inflammation. Now, turned out that COMD1 um, is actually the, the founding member of a larger family of proteins. There are 10 such family members in, in um, um, humans, and they are characterized by a region of um, homology in their C termini. They are all about 200 amino acids in length, with the exception of COMD6, which is basically just the COM domain. Uh, here is a primary sequence alignment of human COMDs at the level of their uh, COMD um, COM domain. As I said, they're highly conserved. They go all the way down to unicellular protozoa, which already have all 10 COMDs. And uh, they're known to form uh, dimers, homodimers and heterodimers. And, and that dimerization process requires the COM domain. For a long time, the structural um, uh, organization of the COMD proteins was completely unknown. Very recently, or recently, the um, a group in uh, Australia uh, provided additional information on how these proteins are organized. Briefly, the COM domain uh, 
forms this tight interaction that they call the left hand shake, <laughs> left handed handshake, where beta sheets form this, this tight opposition. Uh, there's a very C terminal alpha helix that is part of the com domain. And uh, the N terminal is an alpha helical, tightly packed alpha helical bundle. The full structure of a com D protein is not known, but it's been inferred uh, from different parts of the protein. Um, and this is a model of uh, a com D9 homodimer. Now, as we had been characterizing the role of COMB1 in this process of terminating NF kappa B transcription, others were um, bumping into the same protein or set of proteins and describing very, very different roles for, for these family members. So the first and probably most striking uh, example was the discovery by uh, Bart van der Slaus that COMB1 is mutated in a, in a disease of uh, inbred dogs called the Bedlington Terrier. These animals get um, this is an autosomal recessive disorder. Um, and what they develop is high copper content in the liver cirrhosis, and it's due to lack of copper excretion in the bile. In fact, it resembles a human disease of lack of copper transporter expression called Wilson disease. He was able to demonstrate that the, the, the disease is caused by a genomic deletion that affects COMD1, resulting in no COMD1 protein expression. There was no reason to expect that the pathways that we were studying in relation to NF kappa V would be in any way related to this phenotype. Others were beginning to also report effects on other transporters. Some well-known transporters, such as the epithelial sodium channel, CFTR, sodium potassium co-transporter, and so on. Uh, but what, lack, what we were lacking was how to account for these diverse um, uh, functions. Now, uh, at that point in time, I had to make a decision of whether to really invest the time and the effort to try to understand how these uh, proteins might be involved in these other processes. So uh, in my defense, I will offer uh, this quote from Buddha, which I think is a wonderful quote. There are only two mistakes one can make along the road to truth, not going at all the way and not starting. So uh, we decided to um, investigate that. So um, we had very few clues. So what we were doing at the time was to try to better define the interactome of COMD proteins to see if this would give us some clues as to how um, the system might be operating. So what we were doing at the time were affinity purification studies in mass spectrometry to try to identify interacting partners of COMD proteins to see if we could generate a, a mapping. Of course, today, you can do a lot of this in the computer from BioGrid in about 10 minutes. Um, but what we found was that multiple COMD proteins used as baits would precipitate similar factors. Two of them um, that were always present were these two coil coil domain containing proteins, CCDC22 and CCDC93. It wasn't apparent at the time, but eventually it was realized that CCDC22 and 93 belong to a specific subfamily of coil coil domain containing proteins defined by an amino terminal uh, homology domain, which is present in two well-known um, microtubule associated proteins called NDC80 and NAF2. Uh, the domain that defines this family, therefore, is NN for NDC80, NAF2, and CH comes from Kalponen homology domain. This is, a, again, an alpha helical rich um, domain. It's always in the end terminus of these proteins. There are nine um, members in mammals, and they're known to form heterodimers and in many instances to bind microtubules. Um, so 22 and 93 are actually both in the family and they're homologs of each other, if you will. Although at primary structure level, it's very 
hard to notice the, um, the homology. Um, still, this wasn't telling us too much. Uh, so additional experiments were needed to fully understand the, um, the implications of, of, the, of finding these proteins in, in association with COMD, COMDs. So first thing I wanna also add is that uh, both 22 and 93 proteins bind to each other. These are co-IPs of endogenous 22, which recovers 93 and vice versa. When one uses CCC22 for proteomics, this is a, a different representation of proteomics. Uh, this was done by um, Marco Hein in collaboration with us. He's in, in uh, Germany. Um, you see the reciprocal res result when CCC22 is the bait, all COMDs are, um, are co-purified. Co uh, this can be um, confirmed by in vitro binding studies using GST tagged um, COMD proteins. So we term this um, assembly of COMDs, CCC22 and CCC93 as a CCC complex, just going after the first letter of each of these key components. Um, now, that was not telling us enough yet about the potential role of these factors in, in cellular physiology and how to connect inflammation to copper homeostasis and the other things that were coming up. So uh, what was also seen in the purification that Marco did was that there were factors that were clearly linked to endosomal biology. And that was the very first clue that began to inspire the, the next set of experiments. So, in the purification, there was a factor known to be a component of a, a, an assembly called retromer, VPS29, as well as two other factors of unknown function that were, in one case, known to be a homologue of another retromer subunit, and a second one, which went by, a, by an ORF name, that upon analysis we found had homology to VPS35, the, the largest of the retromer subunits. So um, there was another factor of FAM45A, which you'll see later in the talk. Now, to understand why this might be important, I need to give you a little bit of background on what is retromer and what it does. So retromer is a, an assembly that associates with um, endosomes, and it's important in the process of identifying cargo that needs to be recycled, sometimes to the plasma membrane. Sometimes these are cargo proteins that enter the endosomal system um, from the um, secretory pathway, proteins that typically reside in the trans network and need to be reclaimed from the endosome back to the TGN in, a, in what is called retrograde transport, hence the name retromer. So one function of retromer is, is the identification of cargo proteins that need to be recycled to a specific uh, destination. Retromer does this uh, in association with uh, accessory factors, often of the sorting nexin family, we're called S, sorting nexins, S and X, and different numbers. The second function seems to be to assemble a cage or coat over these emerging um, vesicles that will recycle cargo. So by uh, cryo-EM, these resemble the um, COP1 coats of um, COP1 COP vesicles. In addition, um, Retromer uh, recruits another complex called the WASH complex. This is a uh, activator of the ARP23 complex and promotes the assembly of branched F-actin on the cytosolic surface of an endosome. The precise uh, contribution of actin to the sorting process is, is complex, but it's thought to be required to define the sorting domain. And also it's clear that without the formation of this branched F-actin, sorting cannot proceed. Um, 
So um, inspired by the finding of retromer-like and at least one retromer subunit, we investigated whether the CCC complex would localize to retromer or wash positive structures. And that was indeed the case. These are uh, immunofluorescence staining um, examples, staining for COMD1 and WASH, or COMD1 and the retromer subunit BPS35. So other than um, uh, its co-localization with its known um, partners, CCC93 in retromer and BPS35 like, retromer and, uh, sorry, in CCC, Retromer and WASH are the closest co-localized factors with COMD1. Um, now, as we were doing this, all, us and others um, started uh, identifying that these same co-containing co proteins were binding to the WASH complex. So there was a report by a European group where among a list of interacting partners of the WASH complex, they identified these core subunits of the CCC complex. They are listed in the paper, but they had no, at the time, no idea of what their functional contribution might be. This is when um, I was connected to Dan Bilodeau, who already had similar data. Uh, here you can see co-precipitation experiments demonstrating that CCC22 and 93 will not only co-IP with each other, as I showed you before, but they will co-IP with FAM21, one of the key subunits of WASH. And this began uh, a partnership to try to understand what these interactions might mean. One thing that we realized uh, early on is that WASH is required for endosomal targeting uh, of the CCC complex. So absent the FAM21 subunit by, in this case, SHRNA, COMD1 um, puncta in, in endosomes um, decreases substantially. And that's also true of CCC93 and this VPS35-like protein at the time known as an, as an ORF uh, product. Um, so now we have the CCC complex in um, as, an, as a large assembly that goes to endosomes, interacts with known endosomal regulators. So um, this clearly inspired right away this question of whether the, the, the connection between COMD1 and these copper phenotypes was due to the fact that the CCC complex might be regulating the trafficking of the copper transporters. So just briefly in, in um, mammals, there are two copper transporters, ATP7A, which is present in most cells of the body, and ATP7B, which is predominantly expressed in the liver. And depending on the levels of copper in the cell, it's either in the transcology network under low copper levels, or it's mobilized to the peripheral vesicles which have lysosome-like um, characteristics and their high copper conditions. And from this location, there's transient translocation to the plasma membrane for excretion. In the case of liver cells, this is polarized to the biliary canaliculus. So we examined whether indeed um, Deficiency of the CCC complex affected this uh, movement of the uh, copper transporter in response to low and high copper conditions. So let me walk you through these experiments really quickly. Under low copper conditions, ATP7A in fibroblasts is mostly localized to the Transgolgi network. So it's in close proximity to the Golgi marker GM130, as you can see here. When the cell is in, in high copper conditions, so excess copper in the media, the, the transporter moves to these peripheral vesicles. The plasma membrane localization of the transport is difficult to see in culture cells, but you can clearly see the peripheral vesicles. These are fibroblasts from patients with a, 
um, with a severe mutation in CCC22, which causes very dramatic reduction in CCC22. In these patients, fibroblasts, the transporter does not respond to um, changes in copper conditions. It's constantly in these peripheral vesicles, whether under low or high copper condition. And you can see the same phenotype when you take normal fibroblasts and knock down COMD1. The, the dynamic relocalization of the transporter is lost and now it's stuck in these peripheral vesicles. The same is true of ATP7B. So here, the experiments that have been done much, much later. Um, and you can see normal hepatoma cell lines. So these are hepatocyte derived cells. And the low conditions have ATP7B near the, the, in the transgology network. High copper conditions goes to the periphery. When you don't have a CCC complex, it's stuck in the periphery, it never moves. And in vivo, you see the, the correlate of this phenomenon. So in hepatocyte sections of normal mice, there is significant plasma membrane staining. There it's e easier to see of ATP7B. In the absence of COMD1, the plasma membrane staining disappears and there's accumulation of these intracellular vesicles. The same is true with another COMD knockout. Um, so this, at this point in time, we were clear that this, the, the COMD proteins in this larger assembly, the CCC complex, was interacting with WASH, was on endosomes, and somehow was regulating the movement of cargo. The best cargo at the time for us to investigate was um, the copper transporters, since um, there was already a, a strong physiologic uh, corollary to this in this animal model. However, the mechanism by which and the somal cargo sorting might be regulated was completely unclear. So this is what I'm gonna walk you through in the next few minutes. To try to understand that, I need to first go back to these retromer-like subunits that are associated with the CCC complex and try to understand what this, these guys are doing. Again, these were the, the units, the subunits that, that I described. What we hypothesize is that, they, that these subunits formed a, an assembly of their own that resembled the retromer. In the early days, we called them called it retromer-like. Eventually, we settled for the name retriever. Uh, Pete Collin in the UK ran basically into a similar observation, and then we joined forces and published this together in Nature Cell Biology. Um, I just want to show you one piece of data that says that indeed um, you can express all the three key subunits of retriever, VPS26C, 35-like, and 29, and they will, they will co-elute as a trimer um, um, after purification. And there's a plethora of other evidence that indeed this is a stable assembly. I'll show you some more in a moment. Interestingly, when you deplete cells from retriever, the plasma membrane gets depleted of certain uh, cargo proteins that don't recycle to the plasma membrane in the normal fashion. And these are distinct, for the most part, from retromer um, cargo. And here I highlighted some of the key retriever cargo, so LDL receptor family members, integrins, the sodium potassium ATPase, et cetera, whereas retromer uh, regulates a distinct subset of cargos, including for example, ATP7A. So right there, uh, you could tell that a CCC complex would have to have functions above and beyond um, regulating retriever, since it clearly regulates a retromer cargo ATP7A. Um, so one thing that it clearly does, um, the CCC complex is required for retriever to be recruited to endosomes. So in normal cells, uh, if you look for VPS 35-like, you can see that it's punctate and it's on endosomal structures that have retromer, that have EA1. This is the same location where you would find uh, WASH as well. However, if you uh, knock out 
from D3, and this causes a drastic destabilization of the entire CCC complex. Um, then the punctate distribution of VPS35 like is completely lost. Moreover, just like um, um, the CCC complex has an interaction with the WASH complex, um, when um, you don't have the CCC complex around, retriever VPS35 like does not interact with WASH. When you rescue COM3, the WASH interaction is rescued again. So from this, we could surmise that at least one function is um, that the CCC complex provides a, a platform for retriever. It's required for retriever to be um, recruited to endosomes where it's going to be necessary for the recycling of specific subset of cargos. Now, uh, we're going to have to take a, another short detour to understand a little bit about the CCC complex organization before we come back to the, the, the mechanistic understanding of the CCC complex. So um, early on, we tried to understand how this complex might be organized. And um, I'll summarize this domain mapping experiments by saying that we knew that 22 and 93 uh, dimerized, I showed you that already, and that a domain of 22 could bind COMD1 at least without needing to be dimerized. And that mapped to the amino terminus of CCC22. So this was the original initial thought that we had about how the complex might be um, assembled. Since then, work from others has added the understanding that the NNCH of CCC93 can also bind to COMD dimers, potentially creating a structure that uh, might look somewhat like this. Now, when you try to um, look at the size of this complex, and, and we did um, blue native gels, others have done um, uh, size exclusion chromatography, but the, the results are very similar. Um, the CCC subunits in, in, when result in native gels um, appear mostly at about six to 700 kilo daltons. The retriever subunit BPS35 like is mostly partitioned in a, um, as a 250 kilo dalton complex that is of similar size as retromer with a small portion of VPS35 also present in the uh, CCC complex uh, zone of mobility, washes in a region of its own. Now to try to understand what these different complexes might mean, what we did is we uh, studied the presence of these complexes in knockout cells, where we would knock out certain subunits and then uh, reintroduce um, the subunits with um, epitope tags. So I'm gonna briefly show you that VPS26C, the other subunit of um, retriever, uh, here you have the knockout line, so that you can think of this as the background of the antibody. When you, reintroduce, when you introduce VPS26C and, and do the immunoblotting, it maps perfectly with the band uh, for VPS35-like which is of about the same size as, uh, as Retromer. Again, a, about a 250 uh, kilo Dalton assembly. Note that, again, there's a small portion of VPS35 like at about the same mobility as the CCC complex, which seems unaffected. In COMD3 deficient cells, the upper mobility bands completely disappear unless you rescue expression by re-expressing COMD3. So there you can see that VPS35 like partitions now not only in the 250 retriever band, but also appears in the CCC complex uh, zone of migration at about six to 700. So from this, we uh, basically propose that 
This is a C complex is this assembly with 2293 and an oligomer of comedy proteins uh, bound to the NNCH of each subunit. And that it also contains some amount of VPS35 like, whereas Retriever is a much smaller assembly of about the same size of Retromer. So with the notion that they share VPS35 like, now understanding how the CCC complex might facilitate Retriever recruitment to endosomes seems uh, at least a little bit easier to envision. Now, if the only role of the CCC complex is to promote retriever recruitment, then both systems should be completely redundant. And phenotypically, their deficiencies should look the same. And that, that's not the case. As I showed, as I mentioned, um, ATP7A is the best example that we could speak of first, but there are others. So what is the mechanism by which the CCC complex regulates endosomal cargo sorting? So I'll show you here that uh, whereas the CCC complex is important for the trafficking of a retriever cargo, the, in this case an integrin, it's also important for retromer cargo. Uh, let me explain what you're looking at. Here you're looking at um, immunofluorescent staining for integrin beta-1, which in normal cells is almost exclusively, exclusively at the cell surface. When the system is disabled, some of the protein will be retained in wash positive endosomes, which change color from red to yellow due to colocalization. And this is basically endosomally trapped integrin, which is quantified here in the graph on the left. Um, however, GLUT1, which is well known to be a um, retromer cargo, is also trapped in uh, CCC deficient cells. You can see, for example, VPS35 like, a lot of yellow dots, those are endosomes with GLUT1. Uh, not so in the retriever subunit VPS26C. By the way, you can see that in all of these assays, and you'll see more of that uh, later, VPS35 like behaves more like a CCC subunit. Uh, there are other examples where cargos that are clearly not retriever cargos alone, um, based on sorting next in 17 uh, experiments, are also dysregulated. So from these experiments, we surmise that there must be functions that extend beyond retriever recruitment. So, here, I wanted to um, take you back to this interaction with WASH, which proved to be at the center of what the CCC complex is doing. Again, WASH is this acting nucleator, is brought to, to endosomes, at least in part by retromer, and it's also required to bring the CCC complex. Um, it will activate the enzyme that deposits F branched F actin. Surprisingly, and this is work from others that, um, who were developing uh, tools to look at evolution of protein complexes and to predict functionally related complexes, surprisingly, one of the tightest coevolution examples they could find was between the WASH complex and a bunch of proteins of a known function at the time of their paper, which turned out to be subunits of CCC. Actually, WASH is closest co-evolved co complex is CCC and not, for example, retromer. Um, so we looked at WASH function. So the, the function of WASH again is to activate actin deposition on endosomes. There's a little bit of actin on WASH positive endosomes, but when you lose specifically these three subunits and not VPS26C or, or, or the, this other factor, you get accumulation of F-actin on WASH-positive endosomes. Uh, this is quantified here. I'm going to show you an example. Of this Again, these are the fibroblasts from these patients that barely express any CCC22. Uh, in 2D uh, images, you can already tell there's more red staining on FAM21 green dots. And that's a quantification here. But if you actually do Z stack reconstructions, the, the image is a lot more uh, dramatic. 
you can see here that there's a ton more actin on those structures. And not only there is more actin, there's more wash. We can quantify the amount of wash on endosomes and the amount of wash in those three same um, mutant cell lines is increased. So there's more wash, it follows there would be more actin as well. So the question is what leads to that excess wash recruitment? We looked initially at retromer and that was not the, the answer. Now in the endosomal, not only in endosomes, but in all intracellular uh, vesicular compartments, phosphonocytes play a key role in the recruitment of an, a number of effectors. And that led us to ask the question of whether phosphonocytite uh, characteristics of an endosomal vesicles may be abnormal. We tried a number of things and we've shown you here one that worked. Here we use a fluorescent reporter uh, to ascertain the fluorescence of uh, wash positive structures with the PI3P reporter. And in these two knockout cell lines that have excess wash and excess actin, there's more PI3P, but not in this other knockout that does not have excess wash or excess actin. That can be also confirmed by uh, HPLC, a dramatic, really significant increase in PI3P, which dwarfs all the other changes in phosphonocytide. The cell line that has VPS26C deficiency does not have any of these phosphonocytide changes. So it marches together with the actin phenotype. Uh, phosphonocytides um, are tightly regulated and interconnected and they are made as a result of phosphorylation reactions and regulated by dephosphorylation reactions. And in the endosome, the key phosphoinositide 3 kinase is a protein called VPS34. So uh, we looked at whether modulation of VPS34 activity with a chemical inhibitor could reduce the um, PI3P uh, accumulation in wash positive structures. And we could see a dramatic reduction if we inhibited VPS34, which is quantified here. So VPS34 activity is required for this accumulation of PI3P that we see in CCC deficient cells. Does that matter for the defects in trafficking that these cells have? So first of all, seems to matter in the sense that when you correct the PI3P content of those structures, you're also uh, going to have a, a restoration of more physiologic levels of wash on those, um, on those um, endosomal structures. And with that, there's also a normalization of the uh, level of actin on endosomal structures. The most important part is that with all of these changes, the trapping of, um, of cargo in endosomal structures also is um, um, rescued. So just to give you a sense, this is, um, sorry, I missed here the color, but uh, all these purple dots are Condi-3 deficient cells. So there is excess integrin alpha-5 in, in internal wash positive endosomes. And you can see that right away. This is integrin alpha-5 in a control cell. This is the COMD3 knockout. And you have these clumps of intracellular dots in the stain, which look as yellow here because they co-localize with wash. When you reduce the amount of PI3P by, in this case, knocking down VPS34, three different oligos, uh, the intracellular trapping is diminished. So what we're saying is that the CCC complex basically works, not only binds to, the, <laughs> to wash, but works as a negative regulator of wash, limiting how much wash is recruited to endosomal structures and how much activity and actin accumulation uh, takes place. Absent the CCC, there's too much wash, 
too much actin, and that is also detrimental to trafficking. Moreover, we are saying that this is happening somehow through modulation of PI3P levels. So you can change the PI3P levels in a CCC deficient cell and bring the cell back to homeostasis, at least partially. So the next question was, how could the CCC complex be affecting PI3P levels? So I told you that um, kinases are important in the generation of PI3P. So Obviously, we looked extensively at whether the activity of VPS-34 was enhanced in any way in, in um, deficient cells, CCC deficient cells, and we never found any evidence of that. So then we turned our attention to the phosphatases, which convert PI3P back to PI. And, and there are a number, but one important group are called mild tubular in related uh, proteins. And proteomic uh, data, unbiased proteomic data was already suggesting a potential interaction between CCC22, a core component of the CCC complex, and MTMR2, which we could, we could confirm by um, co-IP experiments. MTMR2 is a phosphatase active member of a, this very large family, which also includes phosphatase dead uh, family members. And they form multimers with different family members associating with each other. Very mysterious reasons why uh, these factors associate with each other. But indeed, MTMR2 can bind to several of these um, MTMRs and the CCC complex not only binds to MTMR2 as shown here, but to the same, to the, to the entire MTMR2 associated uh, set of uh, MTMRs. How, why, completely unknown at the moment. But we turn our attention to MTMR2 since it has phosphatase activity and ask well, whether that could explain the PI3P accumulation. Um, so what we saw was that MTMR2, when deficient, results in the same acting and recycling defects that we saw in the CCC deficiency states. So for example, knockdown of MTMR2 causes accumulation of actin in, in uh, green or endosomal red FAM21 positive structures resulting in this yellow gods which are more intense than in control conditions and this can be quantified and, and shown to be significant. Um, the same is true about endosomal trapping of integrants which is should should not be on wash positive structures but when it's trapped there you can see the accumulation of yellow to green um, intracellular vesicles and that can be modulated by changing the the rate of PI3P production by also uh, inhibiting VPS34. So there's a, a balance between the kinase and the phosphatase. If you have too little phosphatase, you can bring that balance back to normal by concurrently reducing the kinase to match how much phosphatase you have. Um, and I'm gonna finish here. Um, the, the recruitment of the MTMR protein to the endosomal membrane is um, regulated by phosphorylation. This is work that has been done by other groups, such that the phosphorylated form stays in the cytosol and the non-phosphorylated form is the one that binds to endosomal membranes. Um, it's a minute amount, but being a, an enzyme, it seems like only small amounts of MTMR2 need to be recruited to the endosomal membrane to, to effectively reduce the PI3P content to physiologic levels. So tracking MTMR2 localization by staining is not really very practical because the amounts are very small. But tracking the phosphorylation status can tell you about recruitment capacity of this protein. So what we did here is looked at the phosphorylation status of MTMR2, and what we found is that when the CCC complex is disabled, in this case, knockdown of only one, it's almost like a knockout cell, 
uh, there's a significant accumulation of the phosphorylated form of MTMR2, which cannot bind to endosomes, and therefore bringing the entire story to, to be about this uh, regulation of MTMR2 recruitment. Uh, so just to summarize and maybe take up the last few minutes for questions, um, Cardioproteins need to be recognized by sorting complexes with trigger or retromer, sometimes with accessory proteins of the sorting nexin family. Um, prior to our work, the, well, even retrieval wasn't known, but the idea was that this would result in WASH recruit or WASH was co-recruited to result in affecting the position which was necessary to create the domain and result in sorting. It turns out that this needs to be carefully calibrated. And the CCC complex is brought in to control the level of activity of WASH. It's also brought in in some circumstances to bring, to, to facilitate the recruitment of at least one of the sorting complexes retriever. Acting through MTMRs, the CCC complex will affect the level of PI3P, which seems to be in, engaged also in WASH recruitment to um, facilitate the dissociation of this and lead to only the right amount of f actin that is necessary for cargo sorting. Um, I'm gonna stop there and thank you for uh, taking the time to listen to me and uh, just leave you with some uh, sidewalk chalk art in full spirit of the of the pandemic, um, and be, I'd be delighted to uh, hear your comments and, and try to answer questions if I can. Thank you, Astra. Oh, it's wonderful to hear you actually give this whole story, because starting from you know your work on NF kappa immunology and NF kappa B all the way to going into this basic mechanism of you know identification of the CCC complex retriever. Now, this is actually a very important yet very complicated molecular mechanism that you are you are helping us to understand. And I try to see, you know, I know I have plenty of opportunity to ask your question, but if there's any question from the audience. You know, just feel free to raise your hand so I can unmute you. Oh yes, there's a question. One second. I need to find who who raised hand. That's okay. Elliot Elliot Ross. Oh Elliot Ross. Oh okay. Yeah, let me see. Maybe uh, Elliot can uh, unmute himself. He can ask. Uh, let me see. Elliot Ross. What what can I find him? Can um well wait. Can Elliot, maybe you can unmute and uh, Yeah, I just the the, the mute button just popped up. That's cool. Um <laughs> In terms of the these multiple complexes, uh, is it known how many bind to a vesicle? I gather that that the the wasp uh, retinal receiver stoichiometry is one to one. How many of these guys do you need on a vesicle to make it move? <laughs> Nobody knows. To, to to be totally frank, um, you know, as you can see, a lot of the uh, models that I, I put in front of you about the organization of even the CCC complex are quite indirect still. Nobody has uh, fully uh, recapitulated the assembly in vitro. Um, and there are camps out there that there's one CCC complex with all 10 subunits. Our data would say that there are multiple flavors of CCC depending on the kinds of condies that come to be. The most enigmatic part of the entire story that remains an enigma is why do you need 10 comdi proteins from protozoa all the way to humans? I have not given you any clue at the moment as to what comdi one does that comdi three cannot. And really nobody, nobody really understands that well. Thanks. Mm -hmm. I know that there was another question. Um, right. how does the CCC oh. Sorry. <laughs> yes. So Christian was asking, how does the CCC system look like in phagocytes with a much more dynamic endosome system? Yeah, I think that's a wonderful question. And, uh, and that's actually, I didn't spend time telling you about phagocytes, but 
Um, the phagosome, of course, is you could think of it as a as a highly specialized um, endosome, um, and we know that phagosome phagosomes contain the CCC complex, and there we start seeing because the structure is so much larger that that there are different flavors of the CCC complex, meaning that all combis are not decorating the entire rim of a phagosome, but they are in specific locations within the phagosomal membrane. Um, consistent with this notion, which I, biochemically, I, or in sub, cell biology type of um, assays, we also can tell that it's not one complex of all 10 subunits. Phagocytes that are deficient in COMB1 or COMB10 have defects in bactericidal activity. And uh, the precise biology behind that is still a little bit complicated. Um, I'll leave it there, but I can expand if you would like. Mm -hmm. Do we have any Oh, okay. I don't know if there were other questions. Please don't be shy. <laughs> yeah, oh, maybe I have one more question about, um, uh, do you know about the RAP GTPase is involved in um, yes. the process? Yeah, so, you know, that's a very good question. So RAP7 GPP, is important for the recruitment of um, retromer. And RAP7 GTP seems to um, also by proximity, uh, a proximity binding analysis, you know, using APEX2, seems to be most closely related or interacting with retromer and uh, WASH. However, retriever, the MPMRs, um, they seem to interact rather with another RAB um, GTP called RAB21. RAB21 is in the RAB5 family, um, and it marks some uh, subdomains of the early endosome. And one of the lines of investigation right now is to see if RAB21 is required for retriever recruitment and in, in, in whether retriever and retromer are in closely related but distinct subdomains marked by these wraps. I will also tell you, uh, Christian, that the MTMRs and in and, and this FAM45 protein, they are um, they are guests actually for um, different RABs, including um, some of these MPMRs are guests for RAB21. So I think there's, a, there's strong reasons to think that RAB21 would be important in some aspect of the recruitment or activation of these systems. All right. Uh, But we have knockouts for multiple of these um, components of both um, CCC and Retriever, uh, both in terms of knockout cell lines and knockout mice, uh, knockouts in the myeloid system. And part of what we're doing now is trying to understand, particularly in phagocytes, how they um, contribute to parasitic killing. Um, so that'd be something, uh, Christian, in particular, I'd like to uh, get your help with in, as, as we move along. All right, I know you guys have a faculty meeting, so I don't wanna be in the way. Again, I wanna thank you so much for inviting me and giving me this opportunity, and hopefully this was helpful. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ezra, for, you know, this wonderful talk. And, uh, yep, anyone, you know, Ezra is right here. So, you, <laughs> for any question, you can email Ezra. Thank you once again for giving this talk. Yeah. Thank you, Jen. Thank you. Talk to you later. Thank you.